Today, everyone knows the name of BTS. They've been invited onto late night talk shows, they've shattered records, they've sold out stadiums, they've made it onto the big screen. These days, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who didn't know who these guys were, or at least haven't heard one of their songs. And if they don't, either they've been living under a rock, or they're 100 years old. The success of the Bang 10 Boys is worldwide, but it wasn't always like this. And it all started with one man, YG. YG wanted to make himself a rap group. In the late 90s, he experimented with this idea with different trainees, eventually choosing seven members. And while three of them eventually left, the remaining four, Teddy, Danny, Jinhwan, and Baekhyung, debuted in 1998 as one time. Their first album, titled One For Your Mind, was one of the year's best-selling albums and won several awards, including the Global Disc and SBS Music Awards for Best New Artist and KMTV's Award for Best Hip Hop Artist. The group enjoyed moderate success and released four more albums before going on indefinite hiatus in 2006 due to their mandatory military service. The year was 2010, and the five-year-old company, Big Hit Entertainment, had previously signed two artists, 88 and 2AM. They had their share of successes, but they were very traditional K-pop groups. Big Hit wanted a fresh, new sound, and upon listening to One Time, CEO Hitman Bang si hyuk had decided that that was the sound that he was looking for. And on top of that, the youth needed someone to relate to, and more importantly, look up to. He had decided he would create a hip-hop group. At 15 years old, Kim Namjoon auditioned for a certain Big Deal Records, which he completely botched, forgetting the lyrics to the song he was performing. Afterwards, fellow rapper Sleepy recommended that he try auditioning at another label, Big Hit, and even put in a good word for him to one of the producers there. At age 16, Kim auditioned in front of Bang Si Hyuk himself, and instantly impressed him. He was offered a deal with Big Hit on the spot, which Kim accepted and became a trainee, officially choosing a name for himself, Rap Monster, destined to become the leader of the newly created group. Now that a fearless leader was chosen, they needed more members. Min Young Gi was a 17 year old living in Daegu, an avid basketball player and rapper. He had been interested in music, especially rap, from a very early age. And despite his parents' disapproval, started performing as a rapper while still in high school. He quickly gained attention as a rapper and producer in the underground hip hop scene. One day he saw a flyer for a rap competition called Hit It and decided to participate. And although he only placed second, the company hosting the competition, you guessed it, Big Hit, decided to sign him on as a producer. Hitman Bang spoke with him afterwards, convincing him to join a newly created hip hop group. He told him to just focus on rapping and assured him that he wouldn't need to dance. He was lying. And just like that, the new group had a second member, known as Suga, a combination of the first two syllables of shooting guard, his favorite position in basketball. But they wouldn't stop there. Rappers were nice, but Big Hit actually needed a dancer. Jung Ho Sok always loved dancing. He was in the starting lineup of the dance crew Neuron in his hometown, Gwangju. He was good at it too, winning several local championships and even winning a championship at the national level in 2008. When he decided to audition for JYP Entertainment though, after a few rounds of auditions, he was cut. Fortunately, he didn't give up and went to his second option, a smaller, lesser known company, Big Hit Entertainment. His dance skills and strong understanding of rhythm made him an instant favorite, and he was signed on as J-Hope. Not only that, but they saw potential in him to become a rapper, which at this point he had little experience with. However, J-Hope quickly felt that he wasn't a good fit and decided to leave Big Hit until RM convinced both J-Hope and Big Hit that the group wouldn't be complete without him. He was right. With the addition of J-Hope, the rap line was complete. Now they needed some singers. Now, just like how RM, an amazing rapper with a ton of experience, was chosen as the first official member of the rap line, it would only make sense that a legendary singer and dancer would be the perfect first member of the vocal line. Right? But Kim Seok-jin didn't have any sort of experience like that. 
Believe it or not, one day when he was walking on the streets of his hometown, Anyang, he was approached by a representative of SM Entertainment with an offer to work for the company. In typical Jin fashion, he never followed up with them because he believed it to be a scam. Apparently, Jin was a very good looking guy because years later, this time as a college student in Seoul, he was once again approached on the street, this time by an executive at Big Hit Entertainment. He didn't sing, he didn't dance. He was at school to become an actor, and he decided to audition to become an actor. Big Hit, however, had different plans for him, and convinced him to become a vocalist for their new group. To do so, he literally learned to dance and sing starting from zero, but thankfully, not without help from other vocalists. John Jung Cook initially had dreams of becoming a bandman player when he was young, but after seeing G Dragon perform Heartbreaker on television, it influenced him to want to become a singer instead. Because of this, at only age 14, he decided to audition for the South Korean talent show Superstar K. He didn't pass auditions, but this was just enough to catch the eye of not one company, not two companies, but seven different companies. This included JYP, FNC, Woolum, Starship Entertainment, TS, Cube, and of course, Big Hit Entertainment. So why did Jungkook, given the choice of all these bigger companies, decide to go with the relatively smaller company, Big Hit? The answer was simple, because he thought, and I quote, RM was cool, so I wanted to sign with them. That brings the number of members to five. The next member of BTS was just as surprised to find Big Hit as Big Hit was to find him, and it almost didn't happen. Kim Taehyung was always passionate about music, and it was always his dream to pursue it as a career. However, it was hard, as his family was poor, his parents being humble farmers. His father told him that if he was passionate about music, he should learn an instrument, and he did, spending three years practicing with the saxophone. One day, one of his friends decided to audition for Big Hit Entertainment when they were holding auditions in his hometown of Daegu. Taehyung, being a good friend, came with him to keep him company, but when one of the team members in charge of the audition saw Taehyung, he encouraged him to audition as well. With nothing to lose, he did. That day, he was the only one in Daegu to move on to the next round of auditions, and eventually became a trainee for Big Hit Entertainment. They decided to keep him as a surprise member, and didn't want to reveal him as one of the members until his debut. In the same vein, Big Hit had him choose something mysterious for his stage name. He decided to go with V for victory. Here seems like a nice round number to stop, right? Six members for a new hip-hop group, three rappers, and three vocalists. It seems like a complete group, but still there was something missing. Some... One was missing, someone that could take this already great group of artists and push it even further to achieve perfection. A powerhouse, someone so naturally talented that they could stand out in a room full of already talented artists. This project that Big Hit had embarked upon needed a capstone. Park Jimin was a naturally talented dancer. When he was in middle school, he attended a dance academy and continued to pursue dance at Busan High School of Arts, where he studied contemporary dance and was the top student in the whole modern dance department. Impressed by his raw talent, a teacher encouraged him to audition for Big Hit Entertainment, who were holding auditions in Busan. He was only 16 when he passed the audition and moved to Seoul to become a trainee. He was the final member of the group, and he also had the shortest training period. What's interesting to note is that the group feels very much ragtag because in a sense, with the exception of Jimin, it was. RM and J-Hope only auditioned for Big Hit because they didn't pass their auditions with the first company they chose. And despite their amazing talent, Suga and Jungkook didn't win the competitions they were in, but they signed on to Big Hit after the fact because of their high quality performances. V never even planned on auditioning and just decided to do it on a whim. And they literally just found Jin on the streets, but perhaps it was fate because this was the group that they chose. And just like that, in 2012, the newly created Bangtan Sonyeondan, the Bulletproof Boy Scouts, or simply BTS, was seven. They had the group, but they still needed the music. In early 2013, they set out to create some social media presence for themselves before officially debuting, posting song covers on both SoundCloud and YouTube which you can still go watch today. In May, Big Hit launched a countdown clock on their website in preparation for BTS's debut album, complete with a trailer and a ton of promotional material, including photos for the first time of all the members in the official lineup. Finally, the big day came. June 12, 2013, BTS held a press conference and a debut showcase where they performed their two singles, No More Dream 
and We Are Bulletproof Part 2. The same day, the Too Cool For School album, as well as the music video for No More Dream, were released. The very next day, BTS performed the song again on their official debut stage on Mnet's M Countdown. This was the world's first taste of BTS. Commercially, the album didn't do extraordinarily well. The lead single, No More Dream, peaked at 124 in Korea, and the album sold only 24,000 copies during its first year. Bulletproof Part 2 didn't even chart. The first year wasn't all that great for BTS, but despite everything, people saw them. People saw the sparkle in their eyes and their limitless potential. And they were hot, of course. On July 9th, ARMY was established as BTS's official fandom. They made their comeback only two months later in September, when they released their single, No, along with their EP, part two of what would be their school trilogy, Oh Are You Late 2. In the music video for the single, they made a commentary on the harsh Korean education system, along with their previous themes of hopes and dreams. No peaked at 92 in Korea, but also quickly fell off the charts. The album debuted at number 4 on the Gaon Weekly chart, and was the 55th best-selling album in South Korea that year. This was enough to secure them the coveted New Artist of the Year award at the Melon Music Awards, the Golden Disc Awards, and the Soul Music Awards. Part 3 of the School Trilogy was released in February of 2014, the EP School Love Affair. This time, the lead single was Boy in Love. <laughs> and the other single being Just One Day. The album, as well as both singles, enjoyed moderate success, with the album topping the Gaon album chart, as well as making its first international appearance at number three on the Billboard World Albums chart. The album also marked their first distinctive change in theme, focusing more on school life and young love, as evidenced by their Boy In Love music video. They also held their first fan meetings with a crowd of 3,000 in Seoul. BTS was doing well, that is, until July. This is unfortunately a dark chapter in the lives of BTS and ARMY. That's right, American Hustle Life. I'm joking, of course, but American Hustle Life was a reality show put together by Mnet that brought BTS to Los Angeles where they had the unique opportunity to learn the true ways of hip hop from the masters. And it was a pretty darn cringy opportunity, but an opportunity nonetheless. Uh, whatever you do, just don't watch the Warren G version of Boy in Love. You've been warned. However, cringe and all, the trip proved fruitful for BTS, making connections, performing their first US concert for free in front of 200 fans, as well as their first appearance at KCON. The next month, in August, BTS released their first full-length studio album, Dark and Wild. The album featured two singles, Danger, and War of Hormones. The album featured a marked shift in sound with a touch of R&B and electronica. It was met with moderate success. It peaked at number two in Korea, selling over 200,000 albums. In October, and again in May of the following year, BTS won on their first and second concert tours, known as the Red Bullet Tour, where they visited 13 different countries, including Japan, the Philippines, Australia, the US, Mexico, and many others. They also came out with their first Japanese album in December, Wake Up, featuring many Japanese versions of their songs, as well as original tracks, Wake Up, and the stars, followed by a Japan tour and a solo concert in Korea. Although Dark and Wild got decent attention, they needed something different. They needed something that would shake things up. They got to work. April 29, 2015 was their comeback. When this album was produced, each member had a hand in writing songs for the album. They again changed their sound, from aggressive hip-hop to youthful, colorful styles. And not only their sound, but their image as well. This can be evidenced by their newest EP, The Most Beautiful Moment in Life. And just by looking at the album cover, they ditched the dark colors and the bulletproof vest symbol that had become so synonymous with BTS, and replaced it with a simple white and pink background overlaid with the title. And then, they dropped the single that would change everything. I Need You. It was sentimental, it was hopeful, it was new. Just by looking at the music video, we can see that BTS has also ditched their punk bad boy image and replaced it with a more real, vulnerable, down-to-earth, and youthful feel. This proved to be the change that BTS needed for mainstream success. Billboard called it one of the greatest K-pop songs of the decade. It charted at number 5 in Korea, and even led them to their first music show win on SBS MTV's The Show. And that wasn't all, they released their second single, Dope, 
on June 24th, which started off with a poignant line from RM. Hmm. 어서 와. 방탄은 처음이지? Welcome. Is this your first time with BTS? And you know what? For a lot of people, it was. In a way, their first studio album and tour can be seen as their stepping stone between old school BTS and new school. In November, they came back with their follow-up EP, The Most Beautiful Moment in Life, Part 2, the second EP in what would be dubbed the Youth Trilogy, which featured the single, Run. The album focused even more on the frivolity, friendship, and carefree attitude that comes with enjoying one's youth, but just like in I Need You, contrasted that with suffering, depression, loneliness, society, and the stark and sometimes dark reality of life. Compare this with the far cry of the No More Dreams music video. It felt real. It was darker, grittier, more humble, more meaningful, and most importantly, RM lost his mohawk. Run also connected narratively with their previous single, I Need You, and another video released in September titled On Stage Prologue established what would come to be known as the BTS Universe, or the BU, which would eventually combine music videos, short films, books, short stories, webtoons, and even a mobile game to create a cohesive story. And I won't go down this rabbit hole because there is a lot to digest, but it's definitely something to look into if you're a hardcore army. The same month, they kicked off their third tour, the most beautiful moment in life on stage tour where they performed songs from their two recent EPs, part one and part two. And part two was a hit, their biggest so far. It topped the weekly gown album and Billboard World Albums charts. And on Billboard, it stayed there for multiple weeks, the first K-pop act to do so. It also appeared on the Billboard 200 Albums chart, not world albums, which is reserved for foreign non-English songs, but simply the top 200 albums, peaking at 171 which is kind of amazing considering that this was back in 2015. They also received Best World Performer at the 17th Mnet Asian Music Awards. This brings us to part three of the Youth Trilogy, The Most Beautiful Moment in Life, Young Forever, released on May 2nd, 2016, which featured probably my favorite BTS album cover. Young Forever was actually a compilation album of parts one and two, so it was mostly the same songs, but it was notable that it had some new singles, Epilogue, Young Forever, Fire, and Save Me. The latter two performed exceptionally well, with both songs topping the Billboard World Digital Songs chart. This was also the second BTS album to chart on the Billboard 200 at 107, and it topped both the Gaon Weekly and Monthly chart, which earned BTS their first Daesung. <laughs> Album of the Year at the 8th Melon Music Awards. They went on to do the second half of their tour, the most beautiful moment in life on stage epilogue, selling out many of their concerts and even selling out KCON in the US where they headlined the event. In September, they dropped their second Japanese album, Youth, featuring Japanese versions of tracks from their previous three EPs, which went gold and peaked at number one on Japanese charts. And only a month later, in October of 2016, it happened. BTS dropped their second studio album, Wings. It sold over 500,000 copies in its first week. In comparison, The Most Beautiful Moment in Life Part 1, released just the previous year, which topped the gown chart, sold about 500,000 in its entire lifetime. Wings was big, but the true showstopper was its lead single, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. <laughs> which got them their first all-kill, topping eight music charts in South Korea. Its music video gained six million views in the first 24 hours, which broke the YouTube record for the highest number of views of a K-pop group music video within 24 hours. The album hit number 26 on the Billboard 200, the highest ever charting K-pop album on Billboard. They ended up selling 1.5 million copies in South Korea in 2016 alone, and it netted them the Artist of the Year Award at the Mnet Asian Music Awards that same year, the first non big three artists ever to receive that award. <laughs> After Blood, Sweat, and Tears, they were on a roll. BTS was unstoppable. In February of 2017, they released the instant hit Spring Day, which, quoting a Korean reviewer, embodied nostalgia and sorrow and opened a new chapter in BTS's aesthetics and lyricism and attracted fans across generational boundaries. Which, by the way, is still on Korean charts. After nearly four years, and the same day I'm writing this, it ranked number 53 on Melon. It won Song of the Year at the 9th Melon Music Awards. 
After the release of Spring Day, they went on yet another tour, the 2017 BTS Live Trilogy Episode 3, The Wings Tour. The tickets sold out within minutes, including in the United States, the first K-pop artist to do so, and went on to win Best Social Artist at the Billboard Music Awards. The first for a Korean artist, but they would go on to win this award four years in a row. The next year was a period of massive growth for both the group's popularity as well as their style. They released the Love Yourself series starting with Love Yourself Her in September of 2017, Love Yourself Tear in May of 2018, and Love Yourself Answer in August of 2018. Three albums that gave us some of the most classic BTS songs that we know and love today, such as Mic Drop, Fake Love, Euphoria, Idol, and of course, All three albums were commercial successes, Her being their first album to top 2 million album sales, but Tear and Answer also did equally well. These three albums, as well as their Japanese album, Face Yourself, proved that they weren't done yet, not even close. During this time, they shattered countless records, their singles went platinum, they topped charts, they won awards, and not only did they break YouTube records, but they broke records that they themselves set again and again and again. This is the period where BTS really started enjoying global recognition, working with huge Western artists such as Nicki Minaj, Designer, and Steve Aoki. It wasn't their first time having international features on their songs, but it was definitely the biggest. And even though they were already, without a doubt, the biggest act to ever come out of South Korea, they had their eyes set even higher. They went on tour once again for the Love Yourself World Tour. During this tour, they collaborated with Steve Aoki to make the song, Wasted On Me. Wasted on me, wasted on me. Notable for being their first all-English feature. And it also served as a jumping-off point for BTS to gain a following of English speakers. Not that they were Map of the Soul Persona. First things first, you can't mention Map of the Soul Persona without mentioning Boy With Love. It was simple math. What do you get when you cross the singer of one of the best charting songs of all time that went platinum 59 times in 13 different countries with, without a question, the most globally dominant pop group of all time? Well, you get this. Nothing less than an instant hit. Number 8 on Billboard Hot 100, platinum in the US, 21 music show wins, number 1 on iTunes in 67 different countries, the most liked and the most viewed YouTube video in the first 24 hours, the fastest video to reach 100 million views, a current view count of over 1 billion views, 7 boys, 1 girl, and 7 different hair colors. They were the talk of the town, invited to talk show after talk show after talk show. The second single on the album was Make It Right. Oh, I can make it right. Written by Ed Sheeran himself, including a version featuring Lau. The album debuted at number one on Gaon and sold 3.2 million copies its first month, and that's only in Korea. It became the best-selling album in South Korea ever. It swept every major Korean music show, winning Album of the Year in each one of them. They followed up this legendary EP with the Love Yourself, Speak Yourself World Tour, where they sold out both the Rose Bowl and the Wembley Stadium in only an hour, the only non-English speaking act to do so. They even performed as a solo act in Saudi Arabia, the first foreign act to do that. The last stop of their tour was at at South Korea's largest venue, the Seoul Olympic Stadium. They ended up grossing $200 million. During this time, they also created a visual novel style game for mobile devices called BTS World, where the player can interact with the members. This also came with an original soundtrack with tracks unique to the game featuring Western artists, Zara Larson, Charlie XCX, and Juice World for the tracks A Brand New Day, Dream Glow, and All Night, respectively. In December of 2019, the group swept the grand prizes for both the Melon and Mnet Music Award shows, the first artist to do that. Map of the Soul Persona was legendary, truly a marvel in modern music. So how could BTS follow up the best-selling album in South Korean history, you may ask? Easy. Make an even better-selling album. And that's what they did with Map of the Soul 7. The album was released on February 21st of 2020, featuring the singles Black Swan and On.
and sold over 4.1 million albums in just the first week, and the first Korean album to be certified as quadruple million on the Gaon music chart. It debuted at number one on music charts all over the world, including the US, Korea, the UK, Japan, and much of Europe. It's not an exaggeration to say that this album left a permanent mark on the world, launching BTS into legendary status and becoming the best-selling artist in South Korean history. BTS had scheduled a Map of the Soul tour for April of that year, which would have undoubtedly outsold their record-breaking tour only a year prior, but unfortunately, the COVID pandemic caused the entire tour to be postponed, including the show at the Rose Bowl, which I was supposed to attend. But that didn't stop BTS, who performed virtual concerts, spoke at the Dear Class of 2020 graduation event, and released the Japanese version of their recent album with an original Japanese single, Stay Gold. Stay Gold! And to top it all off, this was only June. At this point, it was clear that BTS had already dominated their home turf, and they had topped the music charts all over the world. This time, their sight was set for the very top. Remember that scene in The Social Network, where Mark and Sean talk about how they don't want a million dollars, they want a billion dollars, how they're not interested in catching 14 trout, but they'd rather catch an 800 pound marlin? Well, that's what they set their sights on. The marlin, the biggest music industry in the world, the United States. And at the top of that music industry, number one on Billboard Hot 100. This small group from a company that virtually no one had heard about eight years ago planned to take on Goliath himself and dominate the American industry on their home turf. And all they had to do was speak English. August 21st, enter Dynamite. Their first and only English single so far. Simultaneously performed better than anyone had expected, but at the same time is exactly what we as an audience had come to expect from the legendary boy band themselves. And they did it. They reached number one on the US Billboard Hot 100, the Global 200, and the Global Excluding US chart. And they made sure that if you hadn't heard of them before, you definitely have now. And if that wasn't already the biggest flex, on October 2nd, they came out with Savage Love BTS Remix with Jason Rulo. Did somebody, did somebody break your heart? Getting number one on the Billboard Hot 100 again, less than two months after already getting it number one with Dynamite. And on the Global 200, where they actually replaced themselves at number one, the first artist to do so ever. So what makes BTS so special? How did they achieve all this? K-pop is a genre that spans for at least 30 years, and there have been hundreds of boy groups and hundreds of girl groups. What did BTS do to rise above all of them and break through to markets never before seen? Historically, the boy band industry has been dominated by white English-speaking bands. And the fact that BTS has not only held their own, but blew any sign of competition out of the water on a global scale can be attributed to nothing less than their talent, hard work, and a bit of a one in a million miracle. They did it through their own blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak. Around the world, we see that boy bands have pretty much fallen into obscurity, but BTS is thriving. And though I've stated this all before, it's worth saying again, in contrast to other bands who would sing about romantic relationships with girls and what some would call predictable bubblegum pop tunes, BTS is continuously pushing the envelope and changing their styles. According to an article by Vulture.com, they describe this style as much less a successor of the Backstreet Boys and more of the successors of Michael Jackson, whose choreography and charisma were unprecedented. While of course there's a lot of love for the angelic vocals of BTS, rap has also played a very important part in creating their own style. In stark contrast to the typical boy band where every member sings, it's so refreshing when you're in the middle of a song and you hear RM's raw rapping skills, J-Hope's energy, or Suga's soul put into every single line. Interestingly enough, at the first glance, it seems that the success of BTS was miraculous, despite not being part of the Big Three. But it can also be argued that their success was because of their separation from the Big Three. Their label, Big Hit Entertainment, whose founder emphasizes artistic freedom more than anything else, allowed them to make their own sound. And going back to BTS Universe, it's not often that a K-pop group does something special with each of their songs and albums, utilizing strong storytelling that can go beyond simply the song itself, but rather interconnected with other songs and even other albums to create one large overarching story. And not only do they all have their own expertise in performance, but also each of them have had the experience of writing and producing their own music, and they're not afraid to let their style evolve over time. BTS during their debut is such a far cry from Wings era BTS and current day BTS. They also chose to tap tackle more adult issues instead of simply love and girls. While they definitely didn't have a shortage of those, they also cover other very important issues such as mental health, regret, following your dreams, hard work, self-love, and many, many, many others. Add that to the fact that as fans, we can feel the authenticity of the members themselves. They seem 
approachable. BTS seems like there's a place for every type of fan. And in this fast-paced world where things change at unthinkable speeds, BTS has stayed grounded and faithful to who they were and who they are. Those kids we saw on American Hustle Life along with their dreams and passions are the same men who stand before us today. And while some artists like to keep their personal lives private, BTS gives us a look at their personal lives through their vlogs, which allow us to become more connected to them than ever before. What is truly amazing is that, with the exception of just one single, they're doing this all while singing in their native tongue, Korean. Their music holds so much power that it literally breaks through the barriers of language. And no, they're not done yet. Today, November 20th, they're releasing their fifth studio album, B. Their singles on the album, Dynamite and Life Goes On. And chances are, life will go on for BTS. And chances are, they'll continue to break even more records. They've shown that they're capable of dominating music charts across the world and even reaching across the Pacific Ocean and conquering the music industry in the United States. What's next for them? Mars? In any case, they've only started in 2013 and BTS is as strong as it's ever been. As far as we know, they will only continue to light it up like a dynamite.